Hello and welcome to another episode of Virtual Legality. I'm your host, Richard Hogue, managing member of the Hogue Law Business Law Firm of Northville, Michigan. And apologies in advance if I get a little bit feisty in this one. A number of you asked me to talk about the Activision Blizzard acquisition by Microsoft under the auspices of what might happen to the nascent proto-union efforts that were happening at ABK really since all of the troubles developed last year. We've done a number of videos in the series on Activision versus California versus the EEOC and everyone else on that topic, and I thought it fit well into discussing it in the context of the Microsoft acquisition. In all honesty, it would all be speculation in any event because we don't know what we don't know about the employees on the ground that might be deciding whether or not to form a union. Generally speaking, when there's an inflection point like the Microsoft acquisition, a number of things happen. One, some employees will look at things and say, well, let's just settle down and not make another sweeping change while we wait for this initial sweeping change to happen. And that can slow down unionization efforts. The other thing that can happen is that those efforts can be accelerated now with an end point in mind to try to get things done before Microsoft actually succeeds in acquiring Activision sometime between now and the middle of next year. Well, as of about two hours ago, it certainly seems that at least in one respect, the unionization efforts by CWA and a specific unit in the Activision family have borne fruit, but not as much as has been reported. Let's take a look. Nicole Carpenter at Sweet Potatoes on Twitter says, New Raven Software Quality Assurance Workers announced this morning that they are officially unionizing. They're asking Activision Blizzard to voluntarily recognize their efforts. Officially unionizing is a big deal. We've talked about this at length in virtual legality, how much of a big deal it would be in North America for some portion or maybe even an entire company in the video game industry to actually unionize its labor force. But there are a number of hoops that you have to jump through. If we look at the National Labor Relations Act, we see a general right of employees to self-organize, to form, join, or assist labor organizations, and most importantly, to bargain collectively through representatives of their own choosing. Collective bargaining being what most of us think of as unionizing, forming a group of people that negotiate contracts as one. But in order to make that happen, you actually have to designate and go through processes as determined by the National Labor Relations Boards in the United States in order to quote unquote, unionize and collectively bargain. Here it says representatives designated or selected for the purposes of collectively bargaining by the majority of the employees in a unit appropriate for such purposes shall be the exclusive representatives of all the employees in that unit for things that we expect, negotiations of pay, wages, hours of employment, etc. But there are a number of caveats in here. It has to be approved by a majority of employees Keep that in mind in a unit appropriate for such purposes and keep that in mind as well. And only when that happens, can you have a collectively bargained contract with a fully recognized union or as the National Labor Relations Board puts it on their own website, not represented by a union, but want to be. If a majority of workers want to form a union, they can select a union in one of two ways. If at least 30 percent of workers sign cards or a petition saying they want a union, the National Labor Relations Board will conduct an election. If a majority of those who vote choose the union, the board will certify the union as your representative for collective bargaining. That's a two-step process, right? You go and find interest from 30% of the workers in the unit that you want to talk about. And then you go and you have an election with the full unit on a confidential basis as we conduct votes here in the United States in general. And if you get a majority in that vote, then your union is formed, is recognized, and can collectively bargain on your behalf. In the alternative, and what appears to be happening here, you can collect those cards, you can get that evidence of interest, you can turn them into your employer and ask your employer to voluntarily recognize the union. Here, the National Labor Relations Board says your employer may voluntarily recognize based on evidence, typically signed authorization cards, that a majority of employees want to represent them. But I will tell you right now that most employers will still demand an election, at least employers of any given size, because signature cards aren't equal to anonymous voting. And employers know that, employees know that. You can have your own political opinions about whether or not this is a good process or not, but it is in general a two-step process to actually forming a union 
that can be recognized for collective bargaining purposes. Now, some of you might come in and say, as we talk about these articles, well, they're still a union. They can still be something that can work together. That's not necessarily wrong, but the actual use of the term union is a legally important one. And unions are creatures of statute, just like the corporations they want to negotiate against. And both corporations and unions have to jump through these hoops, have to be statutorily compliant to do the things they want to do. So if you want to call a group of people that haven't yet done a vote or haven't yet been recognized a union, you be my guest. From a legal perspective, it is utterly worthless for purposes of determining who can collectively bargain with whom. Now, we know that the A Better ABK movement and CWA has been moving forward with unionization processes since at least December of last year. Here's Shannon Liao of the Washington Post with a tweet from December. Activision Blizzard employees are taking one more step towards unionization today, calling for workers across the company to sign union authorization cards in support of a union. Those are cards indicating their interest to be a member of that union. So what are we dealing with in this particular article? What we're dealing with is CWA holding a bunch of cards from a specific group of people working at Activision. Or as Polygon reports, Raven Software QA workers quote unquote unionize within Activision Blizzard. Quality assurance workers at Raven Software, subsidiary of Activision Blizzard, are unionizing with the Communication Workers of America. The group called Game Workers Alliance is the first group of workers to form a unit under Activision Blizzard. Now note they're actually using legal terms of art here in respect of a collectively bargaining unit. And so we have to adjudge this reporting on that legal basis and find it wanting. Workers are asking the company to voluntarily recognize the union, which has the support of the supermajority of Raven Software QA workers, a CWA representative told Polygon, at a 78 percent clip. We'll come back to that in just a second, though, because as we already pointed out, the law requires certain things of who can make up a collective bargaining unit, certain things that might be argued against in this context. Continuing the article talks a little bit about the strikes that Raven QA workers have done, talks a little bit about various aspects of everything that's happened at Activision Blizzard, and then gives us a quote from the CWA. We ask that Activision Blizzard management respect Raven QA workers by voluntarily recognizing CWA's representation without hesitation. Now that is a request for a collective bargaining representative as we just looked at in the law and asking for it to be voluntarily recognized by Activision Blizzard. A collective bargaining agreement will give Raven QA employees a voice at work, improving the games they produce and making the company stronger. Voluntary recognition is the rational way forward. It's also the quickest and cheapest way forward. There's nothing wrong with CWA asking for that, but it does indicate that on the map of how you form a union, we're here in this orange line. We're not here with a vote. We're not here with voluntary recognition yet, which means we don't have a union formed. And when we go and we look at how this has been reported in the last hour or so, I find myself fairly incredulous at how gaming journalists are going forward with this. Let's start with the usual suspects. Kotaku, Call of Duty QA testers form Activision Blizzard's first union. All right, well, that's wrong, but we can forgive them. Kotaku generally reports with a little bit looser approach to the facts. How about Vice? QA testers at Activision Blizzard's Raven Software Studio are unionizing. Quality assurance workers at the Call of Duty Support Studio are organizing. These workers have now announced the formation of a union. Now, again, that's wrong, but maybe you're just getting some mistaken data because you're just trying to report facts that are coming in very fast from Patrick Klepek here. Probably not, though, when we look at his tweet that summarizes his article with a hell yes fist bump. Not exactly the journalistic integrity we're looking at for reporting on facts that are otherwise legal in nature, but fine, Patrick, you continue keeping on. The worst of all this, however, might be the gaming journalist positioned best in the most mainstream outlets. That's, of course, Jason Schreier, and thank you to Alejandro Siava. I apologize in advance for however I butchered your name right there in the pronunciation, a follower of the channel, who tweeted this to me, knowing probably that I'm blocked by Mr. Schreier for some time now, who reports... Testers at Raven Software, a division of Activision, say they've formed a union. Now, you don't actually see that in what was reported in Polygon, but we're skipping steps all around. Let's continue to do so and are asking for voluntary recognition. The 34-person unit is the first ever union in the big budget video game industry. Is, present tense, 
No recognition required. No voting required. Filed to Bloomberg Terminal. He's filing this with the real investors. Story coming shortly. He should clarify it's the first ever in North America. And then he puts up this article that is framed, as you would expect. Apologies for the formatting here. They've got a big blank advertisement up here. But the title is under the subheading Equality, Activision Employee Group Forms Union, a first in video games. Again, remembering here that under the United States law that we're talking about, that even Polygon and the CWA, who's not at its first rodeo, reference in that article, doesn't claim that a union has been formed. What they've got is 78% of some denominator, here claimed to be Raven QA workers, giving them signature cards, expressing an interest to have CWA represent them, and every gaming journalism outlet that I could find referred to this in some way as forming a union. The best headline for this was done by Games Industry Biz, who said the following, Call of Duty QA workers vote to unionize. And this is the closest, but you'll note it's a pretty poor use of language because the second step in the certification process is an actual election and vote. And the collection of interest on signature cards is not that. It's effectively treating the poll numbers of an election as the final result And if you've ever been involved in any kind of democratic election at all, you know that those poll numbers and that final result are never, ever identical and are very often completely separated. Now, outside of all that, outside of just the timing windows, and God love them, if the Raven QA employees want to unionize, absolutely go for it, but let's get the reporting right. And the reporting can't be right for any number of reasons including the fact that we don't know whether or not Raven QA workers are an appropriate collective bargaining unit. Remember, Section 9A of the National Labor Relations Act provides that the employee representatives that have been designated or selected for the purposes of collective bargaining by the majority of the employees in a unit appropriate for such purposes shall be the exclusive representatives, which poses a lot of questions, but that we can look at having been answered in the basic guide to the National Labor Relations Act put out by the National Labor Relations Board that talks about what's an appropriate bargaining unit. Here they describe it as follows. A unit of employees is a group of two or more who share a community of interest and may reasonably be grouped together for purposes of collective bargaining. The determination of what is an appropriate unit for such purposes is under the act left to the discretion of the National Labor Relations Board. Section 9B states that the board that shall decide in each representation case whether, in order to assure to employees the fullest freedom in exercising the rights guaranteed by this act, the unit appropriate for the purposes of collective bargaining shall be the employer unit, the entire company, craft unit, doing something specific, plant unit, operating in a specific geography, or some subdivision thereof. This broad discretion is, however, limited by several other provisions. We'll highlight only one of them. Section 9B1 provides that the board shall not approve as appropriate a unit that includes both professional and non-professional employees unless a majority of the professional employees involved vote to be included in the mixed unit. Now, that might be an issue here where we're talking about one specific job titling, but it could be. We don't know the specifics of what this 34-person group entails. And one of the problems in the digital economy and the tech economy when talking about these rules, regulations, and laws is that there is a generalized mix of management and professional versus non-professional. It isn't the same kind of economic structure as existed when these acts were originally passed. Now you can say, Rick, that means these things should be reformed. And I wouldn't say no to any of that, but we can only play the hand we're dealt. And right now, mixing professional and non-professional is a problem. And it's very difficult to ascertain how those things should be described in the modern tech economy. Now, how is the appropriateness of a unit determined? Generally, the appropriateness of a bargaining unit is determined on the basis of a community of interest. We saw that phrase. Those who have the same or substantially similar interests concerning wages, hours, and working conditions are grouped together in a bargaining unit, which sounds like, hey, if you've got the same job title across this group, maybe our question and answer period is done. But put a pin in that for just a second. Most importantly here, and this was raised by a number of people that flagged this for me, is who can and cannot be included in the unit. A unit may cover the employees in one plant of an employer, or in this case, one subsidiary, or it may cover employees in two or more plants of the same employer. It should be noted, however, that a bargaining unit can include only persons who are employees within the meaning of the act. 
The act excludes certain individuals, such as agricultural laborers, probably not at issue here, independent contractors, supervisors, and persons in managerial positions from the meaning of employees. If you have that managerial capacity, if you are in some respects in control of your workflow, if you are a contractor and not an employee, you cannot be counted in that bargaining unit. And we don't know what the Raven QA quote unquote workers as reported in these various outlets are actually doing vis-a-vis -vis job title, how they operate at this particular company. Making things worse, the National Labor Relations Board has taken steps to prevent what they consider to be micro units. And one of the biggest times that they've done this in the recent past is in a case called Boeing. And they did the following. The majority in this particular case noted that the community of interest analysis, remember when we're looking at a bargaining unit, the people within that unit have to have a similar interest. It requires consideration of not only the shared interests of the employees in that unit, but also whether those shared interests are sufficiently distinct, different from the interests of the employees outside that proposed unit. So when we're talking about video games, we're talking about trying to unionize one specific job title at one specific subsidiary of one specific conglomerate. One of the questions that Activision could pose here that the National Labor Relations Board would have to determine is, hey, they've got 78% of the signature cards of this particular unit, but is that a good unit for making this calculation when those quality assurance folks have a similar interest to these other people that also work in the same building and do the same hours and are constantly interacting with those folks. Under the Boeing decision, the board will now consider whether, of course, the employees in the proposed unit share that community of interest, but also whether the workers excluded from the unit have meaningfully distinct interests in the context of collective bargaining that outweigh the similarities. Obviously, people that work for the same company in the same building doing at least a similar job on the same product are going to have certain similarities with each other, certain similar interests with actually bargaining how the workspace will be operated, doing those kinds of things. The question becomes, are there differences enough to outweigh those similarities? If they are not, a unit such as Raven QA workers might not be sufficiently distinct enough to constitute a good bargaining unit for purposes of this math, which means it's not 78% anymore. It might be some lesser number when you make the denominator all of Raven or QA testers plus this group plus that group, however that might look in the long form state of affairs. Because of these questions, employers don't usually voluntarily recognize on these bases because they know there are ways that this could go that mean that they don't have to collectively bargain with a group that a union won't be formed and won't be recognized or certified by the NLRB. In Boeing, finally, we have one other reference here. The majority held that the excluded production and maintenance employees generally had the same interests as those that were trying to unionize, and therefore the interests of employees in the petition for unit were not sufficiently distinct. And that's the ultimate question that might come out of this kind of Boeing analysis. Now, thankfully, we have friends of the channel that are tweeting out constantly and otherwise sharing things with us. We've got Will Selfridge at WC Selfridge on Twitter. It says, big stuff happening over at ABK. Wonder what the next big hurdle this group of employees will face. And it turns out Will has written a law review article for the University of Miami called A More Pixelated Union, a look at the path to unionization in the video game industry under, in this case, Trump's National Labor Relations Board, which is changing under the Biden administration and will have certain different angles to take on this. But he analyzes, for purposes of our conversation here, how Boeing might be applied to video games. He says, applied to video game studios, the holding and Boeing company could present an obstacle to certification of a small unit. The studio's artists, for example, from organizing. While a studio's artists share different job responsibilities, the NLRB could find that their interests are not meaningfully distinct from the rest of the studio's workers, none of whom would be included in the unit. In Boeing Company, the board looked at different factors such as wages and terms and conditions of employment, and those factors could balance either for or against a unit. However, one of the more important factors that the board focused on was degree of functional integration, something that seems to be more of a sniff test than an analytical exercise. In Boeing Company, the board looked at how the unit in question included employees who shared supervisors with employees outside the unit, as well as having meaningfully similarities in the job descriptions. 
With video game development, as with most tech companies, the employees likely have a high degree of cooperation, even if they do not share similar work tasks. Additionally, depending on how liberally the board observes the process of making video games, it is possible that an uninformed board member could argue that every employee in a video game studio is supervised by the game's producers since the buck stops at them. And given the recent decisions by the board, it seems clear that the board will likely lean to or even err on the side of the employer in its decision-making, or at least, as Will says here, until a Democrat-appointed board could shift precedent back in favor of employees. Now, there's a little politicization there, but it is fair to note that when we're looking at these particular issues, they do often skew Republican or Democrat on this board. But Boeing is still sitting out there as precedent, and there is a reasonable belief that even in Democrat-based context, the NLRB will still want to seek to avoid having a bunch of mini unions that any given employer would have to work with. How that actually is reflected in video games is an open question, which means that Activision is very unlikely to voluntarily recognize a union made up of what might not be employees that might have managerial roles or other professional capacities and that might not make up a sufficient unit because they share effectively the same interests in wages and how the actual company operates as people outside that unit. So Activision's unlikely to voluntarily recognize it, but if you take nothing away from this video except this fact, understand that there is no recognized union at Raven or at Activision, despite what Bloomberg and Jason Schreier and Vice and Kotaku and everyone else seemingly on the internet is telling you in the last two hours. What has happened is that CWA and the Raven QA workers have done a poll and they've found that they are more likely to win an election to form a union than not. But as we know, polls aren't perfect and polls very often get the final results of elections wrong. So until you hear about voluntary recognition or certification through an election process, understand that everyone has jumped the gun and you heard it here in virtual legality. If you enjoyed this episode talking about the business and law of video game software technology and pop culture, please consider supporting the channel at Patreon or other ways to support the channel listed down below. Otherwise, if you'd just like to subscribe, ring bells, upvotes, downvotes, share this on various forums, share this with the people that tweet out terrible headlines, and otherwise tell folks we're having these discussions, I very much appreciate it, and every little bit helps. If you watch this on YouTube, thank you so much for watching, and if you listen to it as a podcast, thank you so much for listening. And I will catch you on the very next episode of Virtual Legality. Virtual Legality is a YouTube video series with audio podcast versions presented as commentary and for education and entertainment purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you have legal questions about the topics discussed, please consult your own legal counsel.